Well, uh, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast, Dick Cavett and and Robert S. Bader. Yes. Are uh, we in it right now? We are in it. We are actually in the podcast as we speak. We came through the portal of the podcast. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I have to ask you about, uh, obviously, this documentary, Ali and Cavett, The Tale of the Tapes. Um, first question is, you you met Muhammad Ali when you were a writer on The Tonight Show. Is that correct? In 1963? That's close enough, but I actually met him, uh, I was just reminded <laughs> earlier, on The Jerry Lewis Show, which I was a writer oh, for. Oh. And he came on one of the Jerry Lewis Saturday night, two hours live, what you going to do for two hours shows. And I just said hello to him. And that was, that I figured it's probably my Ali story for the rest of my life. But then it turned out the fates had it in for us to meet more. And he came on my show. There's some disputes. It's from 10 to 14 times if the teacher asks you for a numerical that. answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can settle that. He, he Ali was actually on the Cavett Show 14 times. Wow. But um, a couple of them are lost. We'll never see them. Um, and Ali also was on as a guest host once without Cavett, oh, which oh, is also wow. lost. It's not, we don't have it. You know, I, but, but just to yeah. also clarify, yeah. Cavett had been a writer on The Tonight Show, right. and they hired him away to do The Jerry Lewis Show. Oh wow! And, and you, you know, a... there's a story that Dick told me when we were making the film that's not in the film about when he saw Ali outside the theater at the Jerry Lewis show. Mm-hmm. He was doing the uh, the whole crazy trash talking act. Yeah, he yeah. was being he was being uh, shot by for a local television station, and uh, he nicely and politely took two or three questions. Then he blew up in mock anger and stalked off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the two of you seem to have this chemistry that was palpable. Um, it was, I know. It, how I, is that? I, I don't know because I never formed it with anybody else. Uh, not, I mean, I don't have. I have friends, <laughs> friends and lovers by the thousands, but uh, I don't. Uh, it didn't happen with anybody else who was on my show. Uh, we bonded, I guess is the sickening word, in some way that was just delightful for those years. And I was around him right up to near the end. Mm -hmm. Um, And I felt nobody's going to believe me if I answer a question filling out a form, best friend, Muhammad Ali. (laughs) (laughs) But I'd have been happy to do it, and I felt that way. And he was always, the minute he saw me, he lit up, and I, too, did, in reverse. Now, Robert, what were some of the challenges with putting together a a documentary um, using all this archival footage? Uh, I mean, and you you mentioned earlier that some of the episodes were lost. Yeah, the crazy thing about the Dick Cavett Show archive is that most of the very early days of it have been erased. And the first show Dick ever did as an episode of his morning show was with Ali, and it doesn't survive. Well, we have and that as a couple of still photographs. Um, I'm hoping that maybe somebody, at least an audio tape, will turn up that somebody might have recorded. But we don't have that one. And we don't have a show where uh, Ali was the guest host, which would have been a trip because Howard Cosell was on. <sighs> but the biggest challenge in picking the material from the Cabot Show is that there's just so much of it. They were on a lot, and they were always good. There's not one of those shows where you watch it and say, this is not as good as the others. They're all pretty great. And there are a couple of important ones for trying to tell the story that are you know, much, most needed in terms of the footage. But uh, what I ended up doing was, once I put the thing together and I couldn't use some of my favorite clips, I put them in the credits. So when the credits roll, there's some real, real fun moments of Ali and Cavett uh, at their finest, I think. And and the the kind of conversations, Dick, that you had with Ali, I mean, I mean, many times very over the top and funny. I mean, he <laughs> he, he understood your your uh, just unique dry wit. He, he, uh, he that's right. He, he he and I clicked in that regard. He knew my timing. I knew his. 
we, I don't think we ever stepped on each other's line or joke. Um, and he handled himself the way you would want to handle yourself if he went on a talk show. Uh, when to talk, how long to talk, um, where to look, how to look, how to sit. Uh, he was a lesson in all that. It should be a, it should be a DVD of <laughs> how to do it sitting on a talk show. Uh, but um, I, I, I began to realize that there's more to this than just uh, a guy who comes on my show, that we, the way he would greet me or I would greet him. Um, it's like we were related almost. I don't want to get too hokey with this, but... Um, like potentially in a previous life, you might think you yeah, might have I known think, each other? I think I, in a previous so. life we were twins. <laughs> uh, I can't prove that, of course. Perhaps Uri Geller or somebody could help us. But um, we were always so glad to see each other. So we're like, ah, we can relax now uh, with this person. <laughs> Which is what you do when you're with somebody you like. You know, likes you. But yeah. in addition to having this amazing comedic chemistry, you were able to delve into some uncomfortable topics uh, on the show, and really, uh, Muhammad Ali felt free to express himself and 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 really get into uh, some amount of depth about a lot of the social ills of the time, which. I mean, of course, now everything's perfect. I'm so glad that we mm -hmm. live in times that are all those problems are solved. <laughs> I kid, of course. I think it might oh, be. It might be. Pardon my laughter. Right, yeah. but but um, how how was it you were able to kind of toe that line and keep that balance? Well, in a way, I took a chance um, when he was still hipped or hipped uh, on. Uh, Elijah Muhammad and the whole that whole uh, movement, and um, he was uh, beginning, I think, to realize at one point that he had to pretty much get out of that. It sounds crazy to say to be commercial. Mm. <laughs> that that wasn't the best milieu for him to be representing, and and it was very deft on his part the way he did it. He did manage. I think he had a few threats, um, which I don't think he talked about on the air. But he managed to make that transition into the big, booming celebrity known worldwide, identifiable out of a hundred pictures of famous people in some parts of the world and other parts of the world. Ali! But they didn't know John F. Kennedy or Charlie Chaplin or Bugs Bunny or uh, happily Richard Nixon. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting things that we get from Ali and saw a clip from the Cavett Show is he based the whole trash talking thing on the wrestler Gorgeous George, who was the villain, was the bad guy, and it sold tickets, and Ali recognized that. And his early association with the Nation of Islam kind of placed him in that villain role for a lot of America. And I think he kind of grew out of it because it just really wasn't him. You know, that whole thing about the separation of the races, you know, everybody around Ali was a white guy. I mean, his trainer, his management people, his friend Dick Cavett. And it was kind of not who he really was. And I think as he shied away from the nation, he became more popular with the rest of America. And it's not an accident that it happened during his exile period, because when he came back, there was more of a need than ever to embrace the public and sell some tickets. And I think he gradually shied away from it, but it was not an easy thing to just quit the Nation of Islam, ask Malcolm X. You don't just walk away from something like that. I mean, Larry Merchant makes the point in the film that it's a lot like Scientology today. It's not so easy to walk away. You can see what they're doing to Paul Haggis. So Ali was in a tough spot. You know, Malcolm X was his closest friend and a real mentor, and the guy got killed. So stepping away from that was problematic, but he also sort of flew in the face of it by going on what Al Sharpton called the show of the whitest of white guys in America. <laughs> now, wait a minute. There's got to be somebody whiter than me. <laughs> now, there's... A there, there's <laughs> in this very room. <laughs> there's, a, a, there's a very fun story you, you tell in, in the film about how Muhammad Ali slept in your bed. Oh, yes. <laughs> 
I think there are people who probably don't believe what you just said could be true. <laughs> but we were making a documentary. He was making a documentary out in Montauk, Long Island, and it was uh, you know, two, two blocks down a dirt road from my house. And so I, oh, to start this, I walked over to where I knew they were shooting on a cliff over this, looking out of the sea, and they were very unhappy because Ali was absolutely, he said, he's so depressed he can't talk, and he won't listen, or you, we don't know what we're going to do. And I said, where is he? I said, and he's over there, and he was looking out to sea from high up on a cliff. And I went up, and I punched him or something <laughs> and he said oh dick and he came alive they were going to shut down because they couldn't communicate with him and, and I, I I wish I had that effect on a whole audience <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of loosened him up yeah but he was so glad to see me and he did some stuff and I said why don't you stay at my house tonight thinking you know they're in a motel and he said okay but my mother's not going to believe I slept in Dick Cab's house. <laughs> and I put him in, put him in the big double bed, and left to go get his wife from the motel. While I was gone, my wife called from New York City, and she heard hello, and she said, Darling? And the voice said, this ain't darling. It's the only three-time heavyweight champion of the world, and I'm lying in your bed, and I'm watching your TV. <laughs> <laughs> I heard, I could hear her on the phone say, well, Mr. Ali, I'm honored, and we, I will see there is a plaque put on that bed, <laughs> which is more than she ever did for me. But anyway, uh, there it was. And I made him breakfast in the morning. He ate mine and his, <laughs> uh, sort of by accident. And um, chatted. As he came down the stairs in his nice, beautiful suit that he'd had on for the shooting, um, he said, uh, saw me, he said, you love your house, don't you, Dick? An interesting remark from a great, big, tough fighting man. Uh -huh. uh, it was true. and um, There was a lot of tenderness in him and great, great control and extraordinary intelligence and, of course, the physical instincts that made him probably the greatest athlete. It has been said there ever was um, in his prime how could you say anybody was better than that so uh, whether or not that's true he was pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I miss him Robert uh, in, in terms of actually compiling the footage I mean uh, is do you have any estimation of the number of hours and I know uh, I mean just putting together a type of film like this is is, is so challenging yeah, it, it took quite a while. I mean, I worked on it for close to three years. And um, part of it was also going through the other footage from other sources, the newsreel stuff, because part of the mission was to put some of the stuff from the Cavett Show in context because we're not in that time. And when he would go on the Cavett Show during, say, the Supreme Court thing going on about his conviction for draft evasion, everybody in the country knew exactly what Ali was talking about but it wasn't clear from just watching the interview that he's got a case coming up before the Supreme Court. So we had to put that in context with a little newsreel footage just to explain what was going on in his life at the time. Because, you know, he'd go on the Cavett show and, you know, Dick says, so what's the real chance of you going to jail? So I needed to show a piece of newsreel footage saying he'd been convicted and he faces, you know, imprisonment and a fine. So, you know, I had to go find some of that stuff. And, you know, Ali was one of the most photographed and filmed people ever. There's a lot of stuff out there, and I think I found some things that haven't been used in many of the other Ali films. I mean, there's so many Ali films, but this is the only Ali Cavett film, so I'll take it to that degree. You know, if, if I could just say one other thing about the two of them together that really struck me is that the warmth and the friendship develops as they keep doing more and more shows, and by the end, when... You know, Ali came back from the exile, not quite the same fighter. He was pretty invincible before that. I mean, he was 29-0 when they took his title away, and nobody laid a glove on him. He hardly ever got hit. And when he came back, 
you know, the boxing experts will tell you, he had to learn how to take a punch because he was a little slower and people were now connecting where they never had before. He came on the show after Leon Spinks had beaten him in 1978, and Cavett said, you're here to tell us tonight that you're never going to fight again. Because people who were close to him, people who cared about him, wanted to see him retire. Wow. And it's a t- to me, it's a very, very touching thing. Of all the footage on all the Cavett shows with Ali, that plea from Dick to ask him to retire, which Ali, of course, turns into a joke. I, I know other interviewers who get paid for being an idiot. What's your excuse? That was his, like, standard <laughs> line. Uh, but it's very touching because, you know, even Angelo Dundee, Ali's trainer, came on the show and said he doesn't want to see him fight anymore. But, of course, after that, Ali did fight a couple more times and had, you know, that very unfortunate fight with Larry Holmes where he shouldn't have even been in the ring with him. So I thought, you know, the friendship kind of evolved to the point where, like most of Ali's friends and family, Cavett didn't want to see him fight anymore. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I love about the film is it's it's part sports documentary, part uh, deals with also social issues. Mm-hmm. It's also very funny. It kind of defies like categorization in terms of a type of documentary. Yeah, so, I, I mean that as a compliment. Well, uh, so yeah, if you get if you need a documentary, get Bader to do it. <laughs> okay, well, there's a good endorsement. <laughs> Just a tip. I don't, I, I don't know why I say that. <laughs> uh, now, but you can see why. Um, you know, it's interesting that you say it's part sports film because. I really didn't want to make a boxing film so much. I didn't want to use footage of the actual fights, partially because the way I really need to talk about those fights at the end is when he's getting injured. And a a still photograph of, for example, Larry Holmes or Ernie Shavers connecting and really having an impact on Ali's head while someone's talking about it is much much more impactful to show a still than to have the footage because the footage goes so quickly I mean, Ernie Shaver's punching Ali lasts like a quarter of a second. And slowing it down takes away the impact. So I really consciously avoided it being sports-oriented. Of course, it's about a boxer, but I didn't think of it in terms of boxing as a boxing film. Yeah. And a good thing, too. (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Cavett, just having watched you for years... Uh, you, you can call me Mr. Dick. I'll call, I'll call you Mr. Dick. <laughs> uh, but having watched you growing up as a kid, I, and, and now you know, looking at these, uh, these interviews, it really struck me that how the, the way that you could get into some depth of conversation, I think, is something that's sadly lacking in, in the, that type of show. I almost feel, in a way, you kind of innovated... A podcast in the sense that you can have the conversation go where it goes. I mean, the little time that I've spent in television, my experience has been that a lot of things are overproduced or yeah, I mean, it's kind of planned from the beginning of oh, you're, this is going to happen and this happened and this joke and uh, plug the movie and out the door. But you really were capable of of getting a lot of your guests, not just Ali, but other guests that you had on the show, other people you interviewed. I just wonder if you comment on that, um, because just having been a longtime admirer of yours. Comment on which aspect of that? Uh, your ability to have a conversation that goes, I mean, it's oh. like a great dinner conversation, right? I, I it goes think. All, so many places. Well, I guess uh, it, 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 I learned that I'm apparently a born talker. <laughs> um, and I like to see a thing go from A to B to C, if possible. Not necessary, but it's good when it does. And I think I also get the guests to talk and then afterwards say, nobody ever got me to talk like you did. And I would ask myself why. It was clearly <laughs> true. Um, and Sid Caesar, who was paralyzed with talk to talk I did two half hours show in which he wouldn't shut up (laughs) and he couldn't believe it and at the end of the second one he said hey that was a great interview (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that A A, uh, there may not be a B so I won't say A I know how it feels to be a guest Luckily, I'd had that. You know, I was on with Johnny. I was on with Merv. I was on with others, guest hosts on the Tonight Show. And so I had learned what it feels like to sit there and when to come in and when to not, and when to watch the host's attitude and so forth. Um, I, I, otherwise, I don't know. I, I, I was surprised myself, and people would say. 
one, oh, once the stage manager came over, and I said, God, how long do we have left? And he said, three minutes. And I said, we have spoken for three minutes short of 90 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So once it got rolling, it had a life of its own, and it was so satisfying when it was interesting, amusing, funny, or um, catastrophic, but humorous anyway. And th okay. this, this will sound like some great insight for me, but the truth is Cavett told me this. <laughs> um, pe people who didn't tend to open up on talk shows managed to do that with him. And the great example is Bob Hope, who did a 90-minute show, and he never really opened up and was honest about his life and his career. He was always doing material. And on a 90-minute show, after about two segments, he kind of ran out of the prepared stuff and sat and did one of the greatest interviews he ever gave. And it was such an unusual thing because he's used to going on and doing 15 minutes and he's out. And for 90 minutes, he became Bob Hope for real, yeah. which was interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is what I meant when I was trying to say that it, it felt like an early podcast in the sense that a podcast is a, a type of media where you're actually mm -hmm. able to get into some level of depth. And, you know, once you've gone through the material, you can actually um, uh, get to know someone on, on – uh, uh, on a podcast, and yeah. I felt like you, uh, your interviews, I mean, were just amazing. So, uh, well, I'm glad to hear that because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm getting to see some of them now that I never saw. They've had to have tape, get out of the studio around eight, I guess, or whatever it was, and then have to go to some dinner or some damn thing, and and then I wouldn't ever see that show. But now that they're r running. To the country's delight, on mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> on the Decades Network, five nights a week, uh, I get to watch shows I never saw, and it, what happens disagrees with what my memory of it was. Guests that I thought were boring the audience to death were fascinating. Um, Guests whose names I forgot while sitting there, they were so dull, uh, <laughs> were, were interesting to see. But television is not a magic x ray machine. That's one of the favorite cliches about television, at least some years ago. You can't be a phony on TV because it's an x ray camera and it sees right through what you are. Bullshit, bull, <laughs> um, bull. I started to say, uh, and blanked. Um, I, I've had some of the biggest phonies in the world on my show, and uh, I thought, well, thank God, people will see what piece of crap they are. And then um, I'd see it on the show, and they were okay, not great. I have a favorite example. Oh, please. Attorney General John Mitchell. John Mitchell. At the height of the Nixon That's scandals right. in Watergate, John Mitchell on the show came off like a lovable guy. Yeah. And he was anything but. The but audience liked The him. audience loved John Mitchell. Yeah, imagine. Yeah. Wow. They loved John Mitchell and uh, Dracula. <laughs> but, well. Uh, and, and then um, there would be the ones who you thought were very, very good in taping, and they weren't in watching. So it, there was a mixture of chemistry of some kind between the taping and the air, often. That was hard to, hard to decipher at times. Uh, but sometimes when you had a real schmuck on, uh, like Al Cap or uh, somebody like that, I can't think of another one as schmucky, uh, it was uh, easy to see, and the camera showed them for what they were. Well, I mean, the Nixon scandals, that was a dark time for America, and the good thing is that nothing like that will ever happen again. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll never suffer through a dark period of... <laughs> <laughs> I, I say this in jest, of course. Yes, I... If you don't yeah. have one, you could make one up. <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Was there now? There's a moment also in the documentary. One of my, one of my favorite parts is when you are lifted up, made into a, uh, and and you 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 mention you're lifted up by Muhammad Ali. Oh, don't tell them who lifted. Okay, okay. 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 Oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. but no, you're 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 because they'll think it was two audience members. Right, right. Yeah, you you're uh, you're 
<laughs> You're lifted off your feet with, with I, great I, ease, actually. I leave the ground. <laughs> yeah. And oh, not just by an inch. <laughs> nor two. How long can I go on with this? Nor three. <laughs> yeah, that, I, it's strange to be suddenly levitated uh, in the middle of a sentence or something. <laughs> but what, what happened, not to drive people crazy who haven't seen it yet, but will eventually, uh, you'll enjoy this moment. Uh, Ali, though against his enemy across the way, Frazier, says, let's pretend we're friends for a minute and get him. <laughs> and what happens then is televisable and it's a little bit scary. How many giant black fighters have you been lifted up by? <laughs> in, in yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they actually make you appear almost like a puppet. You seem so small yeah. next to these two guys, and they just lift you up like, like you're a toy. It's and, incredible. And, and I know, and, and God knows I'm not small in any sense, except in the night when, if you want to see a funny picture, my curved set, and I stand in the middle of it, and all my guests come out at once. The Knicks. Can you picture me standing in a semicircle? Yeah, there's actually there's the actually another show with you with the Harlem Globetrotters. It's pretty funny too. The Globetrotters <laughs> yeah. tower a bit too. Yeah, and I had a bunch of Knicks on, and I uh, had individual freakishly tall fighters. But I met a man last year who was seven foot eight, and I decided that's got to be it. <laughs> He's with the Trotters, by the way. He's an Englishman, a white man, an Englishman, um, member of the Trotters. I don't think I think the Trotters were all originally black guys. In the days of Meadowlark Lemon, mm -hmm. the fabulous genius of the basketball. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's. But, you know, some small things come in good packages. Yeah, one of the striking things about just the sight of you and Ali on the show is that. When he comes out and just walks out to the set and shakes your hand, he he looks even larger than he usually looks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this guy is a big one. I mean, he looks big in the ring with Frazier. Yeah. He looks enormous on the show with you. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there isn't a great deal you can do about that. No, not really. <laughs> um, I, I just want to ask a final question, which is, what, what, what's your hope for the screening tonight? It's about to premiere at South by Southwest, and what, what, what can be said uh, about this film to today's audiences that didn't experience uh, the relationship that Dick had with Muhammad Ali um, the first time around? Well, just to put it in context, it, it was unusual then. It might not even seem as unusual now, but just yeah. from the cultural and even the racial aspect of it, of all the guys in the media that Ali would become friends with, he would seem to be the last choice. <laughs> it, yeah. it just it just seems yeah. so unusual and strange, but it's it's really a warm friendship, and you can sort of see it form as they do more shows together. And from the beginning, when Ali comes on, he's sort of the angry guy who's being, you know, basically threatened with jail by the United States government over his conscientious objector status. And by the end of it, they're like pretending to choke each other and having a great time and saying mm -hmm. crazy, funny things to each other. And that just seems unimaginable when you look at those early interviews where he's, you know, Ali's a guy in trouble. And he's, you know, pleading his case on the Dick Cavett show. It's just a real arc. And I think it's interesting, and I hope other people do too. I think uh, one last thing. Um, again, memory and time uh, pull great tricks on you. I remember just now that after uh, he stayed in my house and all, and then that made the papers, of course. And one night... About five days later, a phone rang. Are you getting any calls about niggers sleeping in your bed? And I thought, I was trying to think of a witticism. And then he, Ali broke up at the other end of the phone. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> congratulations on the film, uh, uh, director Robert S. Bader, and uh, Mr. Dick. It's been a pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.